is going on everybody welcome back to tavern talk by initial reaction i am philip and joining me once again this week is mr chuck livingston with Heaton's football how you doing chuck philly i'm uh, just so happy to be here just riding an emotional <laughs> high after episodes so, three and four tonight of the last dance and we're going to talk about it in a minute but uh it's a beautiful night here in Little Rock, and uh, it's just, uh, I was joking with you before the show, I kind of got the mood lighting going a little bit. Last week, it looked like I was recording from a, nu- a nuclear reactor. Tonight, it's a little more mellow. It's, you know, it's kind of your nightclub uh, outfit here. It's kind of a speakeasy deal, so we're very Night- excited about that. That's exactly what I was thinking. Nightclub speakeasy with the, <laughs> with the Chuckster. I got, I got the waiter coming through. He's going to bring me a, another. Uh, yeah, so, so it's going it's going down. It's going well on a Sunday. I thought you were going to set up like a Vegas vibe for tonight, you know, since we had the, the Rodman-centric episodes and everything. And just, Well, I, I, I haven't been excused by the team yet, so I'm still waiting on that. Okay, as soon as they okay. give me the okay, I'm going to be – I'll be over at the roulette wheel. Come, come and hang out. Uh, first round's on me. I know if we didn't have, you know, the the social distancing rules in place, you'd have Carmen Electra coming through and everything. So no, no, she's here actually. She's oh. here. she's here right now, and she's just off. She's just off camera, but she she says hello. Okay. And, uh, tell her I said uh, hey. Yeah. yeah, it's been a while, but um, yeah, tell her I appreciate her. You know, not being Wait. a distraction right now. Wait, been a while since what? Wait, Carmen. I don't know what yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> Oh, wow. I thought we were off camera. This is wild. Anyway, Carl, get over here. I sent scary movie. It was all I meant. That's all I meant. Uh, Underrated picture. <laughs> those dang Wayne's brothers. Um, but tonight, okay, yeah, so we're talking about The Last Dance. Let's hop, We'll hop back on, uh, on topic here. Um, we're talking about The Last Dance, episodes three and four. Um, we started last week, kind of laid the groundwork for... Um, not only the 97 98 season the kind of final, the last dance of this uh bulls dynasty the second three peat and everything um but now this week we are getting more into um more of the other key players besides jordan and pippen and, and phil jackson and everything we're getting you know like i said w- there was uh, a lot of talk about dennis rodman and how he played into this uh into that second uh three peat so um yeah no episodes three and four uh, what'd you think? Initial reaction. Uh, initial reaction right now. I just want to give a couple of little production cues, uh, nods of the cap, as it were. You've got some great music cues uh, with some it of is. these uh, montages. Did you notice this too? Oh yeah. Uh, Dennis Rodman uh, with Beastie Boys tonight. Michael Jordan with Prince. Episode one. You have LL Cool J. I'm bad as he's just absolutely cooking the 86 Celtics in the Boston garden. Yeah. It, it, and you've heard I'm bad. And I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, I, I love it. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like this is unbelievable. Um, you just had some top notch. Like, obviously you've had a lot of time to put this together, but just from the way the, the, the show flows and everything else, you've got great video, you've got great music cues, you know, songs that, you know, but you're, you know, the, it, you maybe haven't heard in a while or from the eighties and the nineties, but you've just got some unbelievable production quality there. Uh, you know, I was telling you before the show, I've always thought Dennis Rodman was the most interesting uh, maybe player in Chicago Bulls history. And I mean, interesting in any way you can really imagine it. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the biggest the biggest thing that I, I'm glad that they, they did is that, you know, a lot of – as time goes on, people forget Rodman was a pretty serious player, you know, and a, a crucial – an integral part of that second three-peat, you know. Um, you know, they didn't have him out there as some sort of distraction. They touched on it, and it was definitely there. But they talked about Rodman in his prime. David Aldridge says he's the best perimeter defender he's ever seen. Uh, and and the, the crazy part was, too, his early days in Detroit, uh, it shows him being up only the best guys, Charles Barkley, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. And he's just going, you know, toe-to-toe with the, the best players in the whole league, Jordan's uh, Pippen. You know, uh, so I, I'm glad that they, that they didn't focus on the Rodman sideshow I'm right. glad that they they took care of Rodman and gave him the due that that that, that he deserved because you know, Rodman and and he was in another phase of his career by the time he got to the Bulls probably because of all the hard living he was doing there through the years but you know they kind of touched on the Rodman mentality a little bit tonight why you know Chuck Daly was able to keep him in check Phil Jackson Michael Jordan Scotty Pippen guys like that when you've got those strong support systems you're able to keep him in check I just he's a very interesting character and and but you know there is more to it than. Um, 
you know, than just the, the craziness, the, the tattoos, the dyed hair, the piercings, Carmen Electra. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he, he's, he's a legitimate baller, you know. Uh, for the Phil Jackson episode, you know, they talked about the circumstances where he comes to Chicago. It was very right. interesting. Uh, you don't really see it a lot nowadays where, you know, you bring in this assistant, uh, you know, and he kind of climbs the ladder the way that, that Phil Jackson did. Um, you know, some people believe that it, it may have been even more nefarious than they suggested. Of course, we saw last week the Tim Floyd, Jerry Krause uh, scenario and how crazy that was, you know. So when, when Jerry Krause had a, had a new uh, crush, so to speak, right. and yeah. it, it, you, it's, it's almost like moving into au pair or whatever, you know, like you're like, oh, who's Jerry, you know, clinging to now? But uh, I thought Phil's, they explained, you know, Phil's a really good player at the Knicks in the 70s. And, uh, you know, it touched on some of his antics, you know, and, and some of his other stops. And I thought that was all very interesting, too. All, you know, all in all, like I said, it wasn't Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen this week, but I thought it was right. two very interesting, very ripe uh, guys and, and two very crucial pieces of the – not just the 98 Bulls, but the, the whole three, you know, and in Phil Jackson's case, the entire – the best decade run in Chicago Bulls history. Yeah, no, I, I loved Gary Payton's description of Rodman at the top of it all. Uh, that was, I mean, that was just great. Like it perfectly encapsulated how he played and like what he did to other teams and everything. Um, yeah, and, and like you're saying about uh, Kraus and his coaches, like I had never heard of Doug Collins before tonight. Like I, I didn't know who it was or who he was. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see uh, his, you know, how Michael's relationship was with him, how much he liked him because he was, you know, Collins used him, you know, no matter what, like it, it was give the ball to Michael and then, uh, you know, starting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then to see that uh, Michael didn't really like Jackson's approach when he came in and, you know, and just to know that and then know where they ended up, you know, in 98 and what that whole situation came down to and Kraus, you know, telling Jackson no matter what. And I think, you know, no, no matter what, he wasn't going to come back and Michael kind of saying, you know, I'm not going to play for anybody else. It's just kind of a crazy, again, they're doing, they're, they're, and I should mention the director of this is uh, Jason, um, H-E-H-I-R, Hair. Higher, higher, higher yeah. yeah. I'm actually not sure either. But he, did, I mean, he's done, uh, I don't know if you saw the Andre the Giant one uh, mm -hmm. on Fantastic. HBO. Yeah, he, he did that. And But they're just navigating the timeline and uh, all these events surrounding it so well. And that was just another piece that I thought was, was done so good with, uh, you know, contextualizing Jackson and Jordan's relationship there at the beginning and how, you know, how far it had come just because of who these people were. Um, and it, and uh, we were talking a little bit before about, uh, there was a 30 for 30 about Dennis Rodman, uh, would you say about a year ago? I haven't seen that one. Um, but there are a lot of like tangential 30 for 30s that you can watch around. It's like there's one about the Pistons, the bad boys. And then uh, there's one about uh, Phil Jackson's team, uh, his Knicks in the 70s. Uh, I think Michael Rappaport directed that one. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like something about when the garden was eaten or something like that. But uh, really great stuff that you can just, I mean, there's this, you know, if, if you haven't seen this series before, like, and this is kind of your introduction to it because it's such a big deal, there's a lot of good, other good stuff that you can even further contextualize all these events with out there. But, uh, but no, yeah, there, there's just so much, uh, so much going on. And I, I'm just amazed at how well they're, they're navigating it, starting with, um, you know, starting with Rodman showing that he was on that bad boys team with Isaiah Thomas and uh, Lambeer and everybody, and then uh, transitioning it into those early uh, early uh, series with the Bulls and then what stage that was at and how Rodman kind of came full circle with to play with those players later. Like, it's just smooth. It's just real smooth. Yeah, it's almost like if it hadn't been – if it hadn't been – it's almost too strange to be reality that the, the guy who was such a thorn – I guess the strangest one would be Isaiah Thomas or Bill Lambert ending up on the, the Bulls. But, you know, Rodman was was very much – because he, he loved picking at Scottie Pippen. He thought Horace Grant was soft. And, and for a long time he was right, you know, for those first yeah. couple of years when those guys were in the league. And, uh, you know, I thought they did a good job explaining sort of that mental edge, you know, and Rodman was such a hardened – 
you know, aggressive player, and, and he sort of he sort of owned that that edge, you know, like with the rest of the Pistons, you know. But um, you know, uh, the, the, him pushing Scottie Pippen, you know, as the Bulls were sweeping him in the, the Palace of Auburn Hills was, you know, kind of summed up, you know, the, the passing of the torch or whatever. You know, I've got a lot of thoughts on the Pistons walking off at the end of, of the Bulls just blowing them out, but <laughs> as does Horace Grant and, and many yeah. others. But, but you know, that was a real, you know, that moment it was, you know, but, but I made this point today on Twitter, like people, they, they look at the Pistons and, you know, they were the third, they were the fourth best dynasty of that twenty-year run, obviously behind the Bulls, Lakers, and Celtics. But like, right. they're they're really good. Like, uh, you know, Isaiah Thomas badly sprained his ankle in Game Six of the nineteen eighty-eight Finals against the Lakers. They're up three to two, um, and he actually he balls out in the third quarter on pure adrenaline. They have the lead going to the fourth quarter. They only have to win one game to beat the Lakers, but he can't go, and he, he's he's even he's hurt even worse in Game Seven. And the Lakers win the last two to win the eighty-eight Finals. Then the Pistons win in 89 and 90. So, you know, you saw that footage of the Pistons celebrating. And, like, in my opinion, in a lot of people's opinion, Pistons Bulls was for the NBA championship in those years. Maybe not in 88. Because, really? yeah, I mean, it, it. you know, the Bulls are going to six and seven games against Detroit. And, you know, they sweep the Lakers in 89. Right. Portland in five games. And, I mean, it, it's, it's dangerous to do that. But, like, the Bulls were much more competitive with the Pistons than that, you know. So, you know, take nothing away from the Pistons. They were a great team, and, and they just weren't, you know. Um, but it, it, it was interesting to kind of show, like, the Bulls – you know, the, the last week was about the Bulls. They were they were lucky to make the playoffs a lot of those years. You know, they, they make the playoffs in Jordan's second year with 30 wins. You know, it's like this team right. is not even very – it's not even mediocre. But now they're actually playing big games. They're playing the Pistons, and they couldn't get past them. But – and then it shows how everybody bought in and what – then that they were willing to do what it took to, to get over that hump. You know, everybody, Jordan, Pippen, John Paxson, you know, Horace Grant. So, like – yeah. I thought that was an important part of, of the Bulls' first dynasty, which uh, it looks like we're going to see more of in the next uh, next week for sure. And, uh, you know, and, and it's all very interesting. But like I said, it was a major roadblock uh, in those days. You know, talking about Dennis Rodman, um, you know, we, we were talking the, the rebounding technique thing where he's, he's filing away who's shooting the ball and where yeah. he needs to get on the – that was fascinating. I've never heard that before. And, like, this is a guy who takes it so seriously that he's just – you know, I mean, he, he's going to do whatever he can do to, to get the rebound when it comes off. I thought that was fascinating. I've never heard it explained like that. Um, just uh, that, that might have been my favorite takeaway from the Dennis Rodman uh, experience tonight. Do you think they'll go more into Rodman in future episodes? Just because, like, you know, you you got the full backstory on Michael and Scotty in, the, in those first two episodes. And, and you get a little bit of it here in episode three. But uh, we didn't get as much of like, uh, you know, we got a little insight about his mom and his childhood and then uh, how he was lucky to just get picked up by a college coach or whatever. And uh, and then, you know, continued on that trajectory and everything. But um, I, I was just surprised that they didn't highlight more. It was like, oh, he's, you know, Madonna liked him and she kind of, pushed this philosophy on him and so he just kind of took that idea and ran with it and was like I'm just going to put on a show for you guys because you guys are going to say whatever you want about me anyways no matter what I you know say to you after the game or not so he just creates this persona um do you think they'll go more into his I mean I don't, psychology I guess or uh, I don't know are you expecting more of that or you think they're kind of like done with with Rodman's backstory for now yeah, it's an interesting question. You know, um, you know, you're through four episodes down. You've basically gotten the backstory of the four crucial figures. You know, I, it seems like next week they showed some footage from the '92 Olympics, which is the summer after the the Bulls beat Portland for the uh, their second straight NBA title. Oh, spoiler alert, sorry. <laughs> um, they, um, you know, they're in the Olympics that summer with Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. Um, Jordan famously. Is that a lot the of people? Is that the dream team? Is the dream, dream team, team oh, in Barcelona, okay. yeah. And uh, uh, supposedly Michael Jordan, um, the Olympic Committee wanted to have Jordan and Isaiah Thomas on the same team. And uh, Jordan basically throws his weight around. He's the biggest star in the game. He's just won a second straight title. He said, I'm not playing if Isaiah's not playing. It'll be interesting to see if that comes up next week. Uh, it definitely happened. So if it doesn't happen, there's a, you know, but. He's not uh, playing if Isaiah doesn't play or does play. If Isaiah's on the team, Jordan ain't going to be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, that was another question. Did, I mean, 
Sal, John Sally was a little more like just chill, but Isaiah Thomas, like you could, I still felt like there was some, you know, real simmering room. hatred. Yes. Oh so much. I mean, and Jordan said that like to this right. day, like there's, there's bad blood or whatever, but like it was, uh, yeah, and I love that was another thing I loved, just like from a filmmaking standpoint, was the uh, for the director pulling the clips that he's gotten from his interviews. So these people haven't seen him anywhere else, you know. They can react on, to it on, on camera. Yeah, he's getting a genuine reaction from these interviews that he's conducted. They've never seen these statements before. And to just hand them that iPad and be like, here's, you know, it was cool in the first episode where you saw Jordan react to his mom. But here you're seeing Jordan react to Isaiah Thomas talking about that walk off. And it's just like, yeah, smart. Yeah. <laughs> it's good TV. Yeah. Oh, it is. Yeah. It's almost like Jerry Springer, you know, like, uh, with, you know, heavily edited, you know, it's almost like, uh, but yeah, like I thought, yeah. So there's, there's always been bad blood. A lot of people question whether, you know, Isaiah Thomas is from the Chicago area. And he actually right. he wanted to he wanted to play for the Bulls for some reason when he comes out of the draft eighty one or eighty two, and because mm. uh, he's from there and he, he was he was going to kind of be the the savior there. But uh, Detroit had the earlier pick and Detroit. I mean, he was a great player. Here's the you know I'm I'm, I'm crapping on Isaiah, but he was a great player. I mean, pr maybe one of the more underrated players uh, in NBA history. But you know, but a lot of people think that he might be bitter. And also, there's just the bitterness with the the Bulls and the Pistons in general. You know, they. Right. Um, you know, because that, that was a heated uh, rivalry, you know. I would like to see more about Dennis Rodman, just sort of like those things. But if you notice, he even kind of slips up, because this is in my notes. I told you I was going to do a better job preparing this week. Um, <laughs> no, somebody asked him about the the tattoos and the looks and all this stuff, and he said, oh, yeah, I created that in San, An San Antonio. He said he created it. You know, it's very telling. You know, like, like he – that was just something that he liked doing. He wanted to be – the center of attention he wanted to be you know talked about you know for basketball or, or for whatever it really didn't matter what he just he wanted to be part of the conversation you know so right it seems like that was kind of his motivation he was you know, if he ties his hair if he dresses up in a wedding dress on the front of his book then it, he'll be like kind of like the you know the center of attention so to speak you know kind of like your, your class clown but you know the thing was and jordan says it and everybody says that he was he was a rock for the bulls during that after they shake off that eight and seven start Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he's the guy who really keeps them not even above water. They're playing great ball until Scottie Pippen rejoins the team in January. So, yeah, that's and uh, that was another thing I was telling you. I was texting uh, some friends during the show, and they're like, "I didn't realize, but that Rodman like led the league in rebounds for like seven straight years, and he was you know 36 by the time he was with the Bulls and still doing that." And uh, yeah, well, and you were saying. Um, What's the the ESPN correspondent who was talking about? He's the best. David Aldridge, yeah. Yeah, defensive player I've seen in 30 years, you know. And, uh, and, and you, you know, you were kind of saying you did, you know, uh, those that first series, that first uh, series of wins, the three wins for the Bulls, uh, I'm not as familiar with uh, as that second one. And, you know, the, I – I didn't really know what Robin's deal was in the nineties until he came to the bulls. Uh, and so his whole thing with the Pistons, like that whole backstory and how they kind of molded him and, uh, all that. I was, I, I, I didn't know that I I'd, I'd seen the bad boys 30 for 30. And so I kind of had a little bit of insight into it, but it was, uh, it was neat to see some of the footage of how they brought him in, like the story of him and Phil Jackson's first meeting. And, uh, just like the facade he was putting out there and then how Jackson just kind of broke it down. Jackson's backstory, not what I expected. Sorry, kind right. of hopping around there, but did, were you aware of like kind of his upbringing and everything? Cause that was not what I expected. Having seen the, uh, you know, the one about him playing in the seventies and all that good stuff. I, I was about, a, um, there are two great books that if you're enjoying this documentary, I would recommend um, you check out. Um, the first one's called The Jordan Rules. It was written by Sam Smith, who's made a couple of okay. appearances on the documentary. He worked for the Chicago Tribune. He covered mm -hmm. the Bulls for like 35 years. Um, he wrote a, a book, and it was behind the scenes and everything. Uh, and it actually, it corresponds with the 1991 championship season. Um, he introduces Phil Jackson pretty well there, but uh, – 
Phil Jackson gets his own a couple of chapters in Playing for Keeps. It's a 1999 publication by David Halberstam. And uh, Halberstam's a guy, he's written some of the greatest sports uh, books. And I mean, I've read four of Halberstam's books. Uh, Playing for Keeps is my favorite one. It's about the, the Bulls and mostly during that 97, 98 season. But um, he also wrote October 1964, which is an awesome baseball book about the, the Yankees and the Cardinals and a, a, a famous World Series there that season. He wrote uh, Breaks of the Game. It was about the 1979 Portland Trailblazers. It was kind of about in the NBA in those days, like kind of right before the, the Larry Bird, Magic Johnson and explosion sort of thing. Right. And he also wrote another one that I, I, I read. I didn't like quite as much, although I thought it was a very interesting subject, uh, Education of a Coach by uh, about Bill Belichick, the New England Patriots head coach. But uh, but playing for keeps, he, uh, he, uh, Phil actually uh, gave uh, Halberstam an interview, sat with him, gave him all this information. So I knew some of that. But it is weird to think like a dude whose dad's a preacher uh, from, you know, yeah. playing college ball at North Dakota uh, and kind of the crazy I, – I love the footage of him coaching – in uh, South America, <laughs> Dude, that, that looks intense. Like the, that looks I don't know, really intense. I don't know what they're doing, like what the rules are there or whatever, but <laughs> it looked crazy. I mean, they're. I mean, the, the what did they say? The mayor shot an official, and his punishment was he couldn't come to another home game the rest of the year. That was his punishment. Like Johnny Law doesn't need to get involved here. We're just going to kick him out of the arena. Yeah, no, that was fantastic. But and and then that and then the whole Native American thing and like Brit weaving that into like the team mantra and everything. And uh, I mean, you kind of got a sense of like a sense of it, I guess, last week when you were talking about how he kind of started out each season and like defined it with a theme and wanted to have a narrative to it and everything. And uh, but to see him kind of bring some of those practices in this week and that footage of the team just like almost meditating and like stretching on the, they were, you know, everyone stretches, right? But they had like this extra layer to Very it. regimented, yeah. With, with Phil Jackson leading them in this, uh, you know, on the practice court or whatever. It's just like, didn't see that coming. I just didn't, you know, didn't see it coming. Um, and kind of before we leave the whole uh, bad boys era of the Pistons and everything, uh, you, you got any comments on, cause a lot of the conversation was around how, uh, how you couldn't play like they played uh, and you know take the beatings that Jordan and Pippen and all them were taking and that Rodman was dishing out uh, you know in these days like today it's just you would never get away with half of it more than half of it uh, I don't watch a lot of NBA you know presently so uh, any any thoughts or comments on that that might uh, enlighten me or people who are you know avid viewers of uh, professional basketball <laughs> Well, you know, the Jordan rules, and and they basically explained it tonight. It kind of became, it kind of took on this life of its own as this really physical, beat the crap out of Michael Jordan type thing. Um, And that that was really what it was. But basically, uh, Jordan's really cooking them in the the Pistons in the 1989 series. The Bulls are up two to one. You know, they've got game four in Chicago. If they win this game, they're, uh, they're going to go up three to one, and it looks like the Detroit run is over. And, and think the Detroit hasn't even won a finals at this point. But mm. the, and, and this is actually very interesting. But basically, that night Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars and Bill Lane Beer they stayed up all night talking about, you know, how are we going to stop Michael Jordan? They basically they got with the assistant coach that they introduced tonight. I forget his name now, but he was with the Pistons a long time. But they got with him. He was sort of the defensive coordinator, and, and they said, you know in the middle of the floors where we want them. Cause like, you know, if he gets to the baseline, he's able to turn the corner. Like they, right. they were intent on being physical with him, but it, it was more than that. There was art to it. Uh, it. It was a strategy instead of just let's beat the tar out of dude when he comes through here. And, right. you know, so I, I think that's important to say, but it would be interesting to see that in, in today's, uh, in, in, in today's NBA, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I know LeBron, Michael Jordan's a big, uh, big debate always, uh, it seems to be, but right. Le- Le- LeBron's big enough. He's, f- I mean, I think he would do well. He would do fine with it, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be very interesting to see some of those teams because Detroit wasn't like a, a freak athlete. They didn't have freak athletes like Jordan and Pippen. Isaiah was a great player. You know, Joe Dumars was great, but they just had, they're just a blue collar. The, the reason that they resonate with so many people now is because they are just a blue collar you know, play defense, let's win this game 85-82. Like, and, you know, they're right. just, 
there's something for that, you know, um, you know, if that's the style of ball you like, uh, then that's fine. But like, it, it just, you know, it really was, it, it was an incredible run when you look back at it. Um, and I can't believe I'm giving credit to the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> Delete this part actually. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, it, but it was, it, they, they absolutely maximized the most out of their, what they had on hand. They had really, uh, I mean, Rodman was the other Hall of Famer they had. Joe Dumars might have gotten into. They might have three Hall of Famers. Chuck Daly was a great, great coach, uh, and he actually was a good man. Um, I don't. I've got my thoughts on the rest of the Pistons team, but but Chuck Daly was universally respected. Yeah. And uh, and uh, by everyone, I mean, he actually is the head coach of the, the '92 Dream Team. So this guy, he was extraordinarily right. popular. He was a great basketball coach, and Chuck Daly. Um, and again, he, you know, he did what they needed to do to win to succeed, you know? So, I mean, you know, you say what you want about the piss and their tactics, but you can't deny that they were ultra successful. And honestly, and, and just one more Chuck Daly note, that's really why Dennis Rodman kind of goes south mentally in the show tonight. You notice Ron Rothstein, they have a little clip from him. He succeeds Chuck Daly after the 91, 92 season. Okay. And, uh, Daly was kind of Dennis Rodman's, the first father figure before Phil Jackson. He basically... Yeah. He showed him loving him up, showed him the ropes and all that. But Chuck Daly, well, he, he he made Rodman feel like he like really belonged here, you know. And Rodman was a good player, but you know he gets the right the right figure there. And, and when Daly departs for New Jersey, uh, basically the Pistons were getting ready to rebuild. When he leaves, you know Rodman's sitting here because Isaiah retires, Dumars is still around, but John Sally moves on. Like a lot, Bill Lambert retires. A lot of the old guard was gone, and now he's like. He's looking around. Rothstein was tough for on him. So that played a factor as well. He didn't have that that guy to look up to. I think it was Bob Hill in San Antonio for his season and a half there. But so there You're is the a, only one that would know that. <laughs> I, I, well, I was watching the, I mean, as we've talked about, you know, I, I've, I've always loved the NBA better than, I mean, any of the other sports. Like I remember, but basically, like, if you're wondering why Rodman is like a, a model citizen in, in Detroit and Chicago and it wasn't in between, it just, all the too many guys were trying to, you know, bully Rodman. They didn't want they didn't let Dennis be Dennis. And I thought that's why Phil people I mean, imagine if, if Draymond Green needed a vacation for, you know, two two days to go to Las Vegas. I mean, that'd be all over the news. But this was right. a pretty well kept secret in nineteen ninety eight, man. Like you just didn't hear about it. Yeah, no, it social media would be all over that today. Um but and you bring up two two more great points about how well um, you know, the producers and director of this are just just really doing good at navigating all this stuff because they highlight um, Daly and how he kind of, you know, I don't know if not built Dennis, but kind of just like created, you know, um, a structure for him to He appealed exist. to him. He gave him a routine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how, you know, they show him in San Antonio and then show why and then transition to kind of Jackson and how good of a coach he was by showing how he, you know, helped Rodman rather than, you know, just kind of let the, the craziness take over. And, and, and very much the same, like with Jackson in how he, uh, how he showed Jordan, like, he, you know, the Pistons have built a team that is, is basically built to shut you down. So we have to get these other guys to be good so that, you know, you'll actually win. You know, you can actually make it further than before. And so, yeah, just to to, to highlight Rodman in a way that also reflects um, this other character of Jackson really well and kind of enhances these the aspects that are, you know, further um, further kind of exemplified in other aspects. It's just a great way in and a great way to, uh, to structure it and everything. But um, uh, there was another question I wanted to ask before uh, we completely jump off the Pistons. Uh, why no Lambeer interviews? Do we... <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. I actually don't. Like, what is the answer? He, he's, he's been one of the more vocal, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying it won't happen. And he would be, he would definitely talk. Uh, in fact, just last it was like last Wednesday or Thursday, he's mm -hmm. on with ESPN First Take, and he's he's saying that LeBron James is definitely better than Michael Jordan, but really, 
Kobe Bryant and and uh, you know and and Kevin Durant and these other guys too. Uh, Lane Beer was just always uh, you know I'm gonna do the compliment sandwich here with Bill Lane Beer except I'm gonna okay. do one positive. Uh, Lane Beer negative. He he's perhaps the most bitter of all the Pistons because you know he he had a role and he he had a unique uh, and he was a good player. Uh, you know he was kind of the the the, the hard nosed guy kind of the. He's a, he's a strange guy just off the court in general, but he, he was he was a good good ball player, but he, he was kind of the spokesperson for that team. Isaiah didn't talk much. The other guys, Rodman really didn't. But Lane okay. Beer was always the guy who, you know, was like, you know, and, and Lane Beer and Isaiah, they actually, after the Celtics beat them in the 87 Eastern Finals, Lane Beer and Dennis, uh, not Dennis Rodman, Isaiah Thomas, they say about Larry Bird that if he were a black guy, he would just be another guy. He wouldn't be regarded as the greatest player, singer, or whatever. This is all online, so you can look it up. So this is, but when I say the guy's bitter, and Isaiah too, uh, but Isaiah was a better player. Like right. he's a bitter guy. I don't, you know, he's always been bitter at the Bulls, sniping at the Bulls, whatever. Uh, what what my my positive comment about Lane Beer is? I mean, he got the absolute bet most out of what uh, what you can say about all the Pistons. But like, he's a big guy. He wasn't real fast, but he was a really smart guy. He couldn't jump. Uh, hmm. But he turned himself into a good shooter. He was a physical defender, um, and all that. So he again, he was he was really the the spokesperson in a lot of ways, kind of the, the 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 mascot for the Pistons because he was that overachiever type, that try hard. Um, he's the kind of guy. He's a lot like Rodman. He's a lot like my guy, my more recent guy, Joe Kim Noah. Who, if he's on your team, you're all down for him, and if he's hmm. not on your team, you just you know um, you, you you can't stand him. You know that that's. A lot of Bulls fans feel the same way. I'm not. I mean, I, I think they probably should have asked him, and maybe he declined. But he definitely would love to to uh, comment. I, I I feel pretty confident saying that. Yeah, I would. I was waiting for like, because you know you had Isaiah talking there, and you could just sense that that still present bitterness. And I was like, I need to hear from this. I need to hear from this dude because this dude is the guy whispering in his ear, like, "Let's go." You know? Exactly. Yes. And, and, and now that's the one part of the story that's always stayed consistent. It was Lane Beer. You know, again, Lane Beer's just a he, – he's a competitor, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, he, he he's, hates to lose. You know, he's crying on the flight after they blow that 88 finals to the Lakers. He's He takes mm-hmm. it harder perhaps than anybody, you know. So, it you respect the guy who competes like that. It border, it's borderline dirty, you know, uh, frowned upon. But uh, he was a good player, and, uh, you know, that was part of it. So, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't have minded it just to see – just so I could have laughed at him. But – uh <laughs> They uh, they went with John Sally instead, who was also a good player. So yeah, uh, yeah, no, the, he was definitely uh, he, he brought some balance to it to that uh, that whole scenario. I think. Well, um, was, let's not forget he won a championship with the Bulls in 1996. So he's ring chasing in the in the in the 90s too. So he's he, okay. if you're wondering why he might be a little more measured, he was a Bulls. Uh, 11th man uh, for the 90, the, the 72 win 96 Bulls. So people forget that, but I, I didn't I, realize I, that. No, he didn't play much, but he was he was there, and he he's got a ring. So he's got a ring with the Bad Boy Pistons and the the 96 Bulls. Yes. My favorite part was um, I didn't realize uh, Ron Harper was on the Cavs on that team with the the iconic shot. You know that the shot. Yes. Yeah, the shot. Um, <laughs> and his comment. <laughs> At this time. <laughs> I was dying. I was like, dude, I hope we get more Ron Harper in the future. I mean, I'm sure we will. But <laughs> oh no, we will. Yeah. But, <laughs> but actually, no. but before before we get off, we need to do like a top three power ranking of quotes through four episodes because I got to think Harper's. That's up if there. This be it. I think he's up there. Horace is up there, and Scotty. Well, I'll just give it to you right now. I'm going Harper one. If this be us, uh, Horace two. Straight up. Straight up bitches. Yachts three. <laughs> Is uh three is definitely Scotty. I'm not gonna blank my summer up. Like th- 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 those are the those are my three. I don't know what yours are, but I'll, I want to hear them. It, I, I, I can get down with that. Yeah, I can get down with that. I'll, I'll pay more attention and write them down next time. But uh, I can get down with that for sure. Um, I was trying to think. I'm looking through my notes here to see. Uh, a quick aside on Harper. While you look, uh, yeah, this guy was a heck of a player with the Cavs. He was a reason that the Cavs were such a problem in those days. He really did a good job on Michael Jordan. He had a really bad knee injury in 1991 or 1992. And this is the days before it was such a science where you've done it so many times now. Mm -hmm. Harper was like a 24 point a game guy with Cleveland in the the, the late, or probably around the same time that, you know, Elo was fine, Brad Doherty was good, but Ron Harper and Mark Price 
that was a great backcourt. And, you know, people certainly tuning into this, they remember Harper is the defensive guy with the Bulls, but he was a he was an all-star a couple of years. I'm, I know he was in the late 80s, and then he had that knee injury. He was never the same. Mm. You know, so he has a different niche on the, the late 90s Bulls. But uh, but Ron Harper uh, with Cleveland was, was something else. I mean, he – they really should have put him on Jordan. Now, Jordan still makes the shot, I'm sure, but it would have been – you at least that's, lose your – Yeah, that – I mean, that's crazy, the, the idea of that, that changing because that is – I mean, like you said, that's the shot. And I had that uh, that late 80s Cavs Mark Price jersey for nice. reasons I'm sure you can conclude because uh, – there name was on no, the back and everything. Yeah, there's nothing like walking around elementary school with your name on the back of an NBA jersey. That was awesome. Philip, uh, I didn't know you played for the Cavs. Like, you're dang right I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's weekends. I just go on weekends. I got to stay in school. Uh, no. Um, you actually uh, kind of look like Mark Price now that you mention it. Holy crap. Oh, I got to go look up Mark Price now. I don't remember what he looks like. He's a, stra- he's a strapping young man. Well, good. I'll take that. The um, the shot of Rodman in pajama pants at practice was amazing. I have that amazing. same thing. Yes, uh, <laughs> that was. I had the same. I, I was yeah. Before we pitched for Rodman, I was gonna say that it just gives you an insight into like where this guy's mind was. Like, man, you come get me out of my hotel room. I'm in pajama pants. Like, You're, like this is the NBA. You're in the in the highest form of like sports competition in in the world in this sport. And Michael Jordan is over here saying, look, coach, just be thankful his body's here. Don't ask anymore. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I guess we're going to be cool with that. Because, like, how – I just to be that valuable of an asset must be – like, I can't even comprehend that. It's just no, so, I, I'm so replaceable, it's not even funny. Dennis is out here gone for five days to Vegas, party with Carmen Electra. He's on a bender. He's drinking Coors and riding his motorcycle. I mean, it, incredible. Like, yeah, it, it was – it's just it's just experience, man. Yeah, it, it, just imagine that. Like, I, I can't, I can't even imagine to know, like, to have been a fly on the wall with that dude is, uh, is crazy. Um, what was the other thing? Uh, I just wanted to note, uh, how old are you right now? Thirty-two. Okay, when do you turn thirty-three? September third. Okay, I just turned thirty-three. Uh, Michael is thirty-five at the beginning of nineteen ninety-eight, and it just kind of is like God. I've done nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, I wouldn't say you've done nothing. You got no, I know, there, but, like, got, but like, but like, on the on the you're right in the in the span of all that, yeah. But like, I mean, you I like thinking what age we were watching thirty five oh, year old Michael, and then now to be like there and just be like, God, he was this age when he was doing that. It's nuts. The, the uh, incredible thing to me was Michael Jordan was only like five months older, or he was five months older than my dad. So like. Oh, really? They were both born in 61, so like we'd be watching these games. Really, the, the, the second, from when, you know, really, you know, the 93, 90, you know, 93 finals on, like, you know, mm-hmm. I'm just like, I'm just like, man, my dad's like, he's like 5'8", five, five he's like, he's like, he's like 230, like Jordan's out here just hooping on, like, I was like, this is incredible. Like, it, you know, it, when you put it in perspective like that, it's like, oh my gosh, like. I know, I know. Uh, here's a stat for you, too. My, okay. Michael Jordan, since he returned from baseball, did not miss a single regular season or playoff game from uh, March of 1995 through game six of the 1998 finals. Didn't miss it. In this era of load management, guys not playing back-to-back, second half of back-to-backs, whatever else, unheard of. You know, guys today, either 60 games is kind of ideal. I just think it's incredible to, to think about what he was able to do and play at such a high level. Uh, the other thing, going back to the Phil Jackson, you know, kind of the au pair uh, comparison mm-hmm. is the, um, the uh, you know, Tex Winter. So Tex Winter was one of the first hires at Jerry Krause, and they even touched on this tonight, but he just he, – Tex Winter was a, a brilliant uh, college basketball coach at Kansas State. You saw him coaching the triangle offense tonight, and Jerry Krause was just always enamored with him. It kind of makes you wonder why they never hired him to be the head coach uh, but they didn't for whatever reason. But anyway, he was a constant on the staff. And um, a lot of people believe that uh, Doug Collins banishing him to press row away from the bench um, was kind of the last straw, that and not being able to beat the Pistons in the uh, the Doug Collins as head coach of Chicago Bulls era. Now Collins goes on to coach Philadelphia, uh, the Wizards. I think he coaches the Nuggets for a couple of years. So Collins, and he also used to do some uh, – some reporting for TNT as well. So Collins has been around, but uh, that's kind of how the Bulls tenure ends uh, there uh, because he got sideways with Jerry Krause. Stop me if you've heard this before. 
Um, you know, <laughs> well, and while we're right there, real quick, um, I have to uh, give props to the. Uh, I don't know who the anchor was that said it, but that uh, awesome burn on Doug Collins. The uh, if you're getting for work or if you're getting ready for work right now, you're probably not Doug Collins. <laughs> <laughs> Collins was fired this morning. I was like, dang. It's uh, almost like it reminds you of the old. Uh, hey, raise your hand if. Uh, Raise your hand if your girlfriend was making out with somebody else at the party on Friday night. Not so fast, Philip. <laughs> You're like, oh no. <laughs> it was just so. I was just like, dang, dude. Uh, but yeah, no. The um, and the text winner thing is is kind of fascinating because um, it goes into the real like. Uh, I don't even know how to phrase it because I'm not like a huge you know sports head or anything, but just like the technicalities of the game and. Uh, and a thing we were touching on before we started recording was um, Rodman's intelligence when it come when it came to playing the game and how he would. It was just fascinating that he would, you know, have a friend go out there and shoot, and you know, from all these different angles and see where the, the ball would bounce off of the rim at, so he would know where to be on the court. Uh, I just love little insights like that, and like because um, some of this footage is just crazy, incredible. Like the. Uh, the little bit there where Jordan and Rodman are having the exchange on the bench. And about, about bump or uh, the, the, the part about uh, sit, tell me when the back screen's coming about yes. Oak or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just, did you see the people in the background just like watching them? Like, like just on the, yeah. It, it was like they were watching, I don't know, like, I don't even know, like God and Jesus having an exchange in, in direction or something. Well, I don't even know what to say, but it was like, Dang, just to, to have that because it could have been lost like that little moment could be lost in time but to have that on film is crazy well and, and the jordan pippen one later too yeah i agree that's been my favorite part by far just like some of like the how they're talking interact on the court you know they're, they're talking about uh you know you, you got to bump them a little bit or whatever and it's like oh you tell you what let's just switch it or whatever like yeah just kind of talking shop it's it's kind of a yeah. look that you don't really get it, you know, uh, on a normal circumstance. Yeah, exactly. No, talking shop is exactly just to get that kind of inside basketball uh, is, is it's just it's the coolest part to me. But no, uh, what else? What else uh, uh, did you want to hit about the, these yeah, two I'm, episodes before we kind of wrap things up here? Got, got one more note. It's almost like we did it by design, but it's kind of looking forward now. Um, you know the. The, the Bulls lose in Indiana uh, to fall to eight and seven, which was their uh, their low water mark, you know. And they, they made a point of showing that ball game, and that's when Dennis Rodman figured out he really needed to turn it on. The very last thing we see tonight, the Bulls blowing a massive lead. The Monday or Tuesday after the Super Bowl, nineteen ninety eight, the Bulls had beaten the Jazz in the ninety seven finals. A lot of those games were close. Uh, the Jazz, they didn't show this game, but it, it wasn't very interesting, as I recall. But uh, the Jazz had already won in Chicago in October, November, and mm -hmm. the Bulls go and blow this big lead in Utah in February. Um, and both of these games are going to factor in in the, the coming, uh, the next three weeks. Uh, I'm going to leave you with that, but uh, I, I'm sure there's a reason that they were included because uh, oh, yeah. th th those are, you know, th 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 that's going to, they're, they're going to gain some. Uh, it, it, they're going to be very crucial as this uh, this series unfolds. But uh, uh, obviously, very interesting blowing a twenty three point lead, something the Bulls didn't normally do, and they did to Utah and uh, in Indiana. You know, under a first year coach, uh, a guy you might have heard of, Larry Bird, in nineteen ninety seven ninety eight. So there you go. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I I remember those. Those are the series I remember most, like from my childhood and everything. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to see seeing the behind the scenes and like all this stuff because you know a lot of the the management stuff i didn't know about i had no idea i don't think i was even aware that this was probably the last time this team would be together uh you know i didn't really have a grasp on any of that so uh i'll, I'll be very interested to see the emotions that were going on behind these games that were being played that i was so invested in at the time um and the only other thing i wanted to uh you, you mentioned earlier the musical cues in this, and uh, yeah, you mentioned Prince and, and Beastie Boys and uh, LL Cool J. Uh, my favorite one of the night was uh, when they when they finally won, uh, you get or you get a Michael montage and you get that cool Modi, how you like me now. I heard that so many times as a kid, and it just puts you back in that era, and it's like you were saying, and it's 
it was so good. Just, I'm loving everything about this. I was grinning ear to ear. So I'm, I'm, I can't wait to, like we said last week, I could have watched the rest right now, but I'm, I'm glad we're getting this spaced out because I'm looking forward to the next parts and I, I just can't wait. Yeah, I feel the same way. Like it's, I've, I've kind of been going through this with Better Call Saul. It's a show I've really been interested in since Breaking Bad, which, which was an all timer, obviously. Oh, yeah. but, you know, I, I like Better Call Saul fine. It's not Breaking Bad, but it, you know, the, the one episode a week, you know, it really gives you time to digest where when Ozark came out, um, I'm working from the house that day, but I got all my stuff done the first couple, Monday through Thursday. So I had just a Friday off. And man, I woke up at nine o'clock. I, I got breakfast at Burger King. I, come, I came in here and like, I just, I watched eight or I guess it was eight or two, well, however many episodes it was. I watched it. I took like a break after episode five. I, I made some dinner. Uh, I, I did some other things I had to do. And I came back and I watched that night and I'm like, it was cool, but like, I didn't do anything with my day. And I was at the end of it. I'm just like, man, like, why did I blow through this? It's awesome. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, so I'm kind of glad they're doing it this way because it yeah. is like, it gives you time to digest. It gives you time to, to, to reflect a little bit. I think two episodes is, is really, really good because you're still getting five weeks of programming. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and you can kind of look back, you know, like I, th I think any less would be too slow. If you try to do three, I think it's too much going on. I think two right. is, is ideal. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. No, these are like the fastest hours of my life. I feel like, so if it was only one a week, I'd be like, no way. This is sucks, that, yeah. that's it? No, two is, two is great. It's like you get a new movie every week or something like that. So it's, it's, it's perfect. I love it. I can't wait uh, till next week, but uh, thank you once again for joining me. I can't, you know, I look forward to our conversation about episodes five and six next week. Uh, anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, it's just a, uh, it's just incredible that they've got all this footage, you know, like, I mean, obviously in the archives, like, and here's the deal. There's going to be so much stuff that doesn't make it. Like I, I want to watch the director's cut. I want to watch the 30 yeah. hour last dance, like, and we'll, we'll see what all makes it, but they, they followed the team the entire season. So, you know, there's going to be good stuff that doesn't make it practice footage game. Fo like it's just, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's going to be awesome. It, it's been everything I expected it to be so far and, and even better. So it's, yeah, I agree. The two hours just zoom by like it, Tonight, it's like 9.45 before I ever knew what was going on. Like, I know. I know. I, yeah, and I, you know, I kind of went back and did a little more research on uh, how this came to be. And, like, what we're seeing is what Jordan signed off on. Like Basically what, he, what, yeah, yeah. What he approved. So, yeah, I can't imagine the footage that he's he didn't allow in this thing, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I'd love to see it. But, yeah, it, it, I mean, even the story about how this thing came to happen and, the fact that it that apparently Michael even signed off on it at all is is pretty amazing. So yeah, I, I'm I'm excited for it. I'm I'm glad it's happening. And uh, yeah, I still don't understand. I think still the core question at the center of it is why Kraus was so hell bent on uh, breaking this up after that year. Like I don't. I hope there's some kind of. I know I know it's probably impossible because he's no longer with us, but. Uh, I hope there's a little bit of closure or something around that. I don't know if there will be, and you you might know the answer to that already. Uh, but just but yeah. basically, you know, they touch on it. And he, he was just he was so sick of the of the player that he didn't draft Michael Jordan, getting all the accolades and things like. You know, he was trying to, but basically, it was at the so it was basically his ego is the short is the short version. You know, his ego wouldn't allow him. And, and and he was just thinking like, man, like I discovered Scottie Pippen, I discovered Horace Grant, you know, I discovered B.J. Armstrong, like, you know, we could, you know, we, we could, I, I could just do this just as easily again. But, you know, Michael Jordan was at the end of the day, Michael Jordan's the reason this thing went, you know. Yeah. Um, and he just resented all that. The other thing was, at the end of the 97-98 season, everything was kind of at the end of its course anyway. So like, hmm. Scottie Pippen was a free agent after that season, after that long extension he signed in the 91 season, he's a free agent and he had vowed not to re-sign with Chicago, mm. um, which is the bull, he's the bull second best player uh, at the time. So he's saying he's not gonna come back. Well, you still could run it back with Jordan, maybe yeah. spend his money elsewhere, but Kraus alienated Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan hitched his wagon to Phil. So basically you would have, even if they had swallowed their pride, even if Jerry had swallowed his pride and crawled back to Phil and I and honestly Phil has said a couple times he was done too. He was fed up with it. Yeah. Um so basically it was 
you know, everything runs its course, right? You know, every, what is the old saying? Everything ends badly or else it wouldn't end. Um, right. that, that, that's, that's where you're at with the 97 Bulls. It, it was it was wonderful, but Krause had alienated Scotty. He really alienated Michael Jordan, but Jordan probably comes back if the other circumstances are at play. Also, Dennis Rodman, you saw he's he's just ready to fly off the handle at the end of the 98 season. I mean, he's going to Vegas for days. It, it was over, uh, mm. you know, no matter what had happened. Uh, but it was because of Krause's own actions. It was almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Um, so basically, it, it was almost predetermined. Um, you know, and Jerry Reinsdorf wasn't going to throw his body in front of it and say, all right, we're going to keep this thing together as long as we can. I guess that was kind of my question, or kind of a question too. Like, why, why did this guy let him have so much power and say so in it? But I mean, I get, and they did mention like they didn't want to spend the 80 million to keep the four, you know, key people in place and everything. Uh, but now, yeah, that's kind of. So that, 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 that's pretty much it. It's it's really sad because like it would probably never happen today, but that, that's just kind of what it was. And Kraus again, he he basically figured out, man, this is a lot harder than I thought. And yeah. uh, you know, he retires after the 90, 90, 0, 02, 03 season. So he, he gets out while the getting's good. And actually John Paxson succeeds him as the Bulls GM. So that's right. Yeah. I saw time that. is a time is a flat circle. <laughs> that's crazy. Well, thank you, sir. I do appreciate you joining me once again this week. I look forward again to next week. Uh as we just get further into this. I'm, I'm loving it. Um, but thank you guys for watching as well. Uh, if you like what we're doing, if you've checked out other videos on the channel, uh, kind of seeing what we do, we typically we review the biggest movie releases of the week at the movie tavern, uh, so theatrical releases. But, you know, crazy circumstances call for uh, different, uh, you know, different takes on things, innovative takes on things, and that's what we're trying to do here. So uh, we hope you're liking what we're, you know, doing and talking about The Last Dance, 10-part uh, documentary event, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you, Chuck, for joining me once again, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. Peace.